Hi, and welcome to a video sermon from First Baptist Church Lloyd Minster, where joyfully you could be here. We hope you'll be encouraged by the words you hear today, and that God will speak to you through this message. If you want more information about First Baptist Church, visit our website at fbclloyd.ca, and download our app for Apple, Android, and Windows Phone. Now, here's the latest from First Baptist Church. We hope you enjoy. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Woo! Woo! That's awesome. If I'm a little more stiff than usual, I have a, a reason for it this week. I have been spending considerable time chopping ice. Yesterday, about an hour and a half, trying to move a puddle from here to a sewer line near us. It, was a, it, was not, it wasn't really so much a puddle as an ocean. We've got a baptism service coming up in a couple of weeks. I thought maybe we we're going to use that. But um, anyways, I am wrecked from here up. So I might be doing a little bit of this today. And it's not me trying to do the robot. Although this is probably as good as I'll get at that. Anyway. Um, hey, so we're in the last chapter of James. We're finishing up our series on James. And um, as Ryan has said before, we just can't do justice to James in 30 minutes, 35 minutes um, on a Sunday morning, especially taking it in chunks a chapter at a time. And that's definitely going to be the case today. So there's going to be um, large pieces of the chapter that I'm going to leave out. You'll see in your uh, bulletin, we're just going to look primarily at two passages in the chapter. And I'm going to leave lots for you to discuss in your small groups that coming up this week. So if uh, I, we don't hit on all the stuff that you're interested in or the, the questions that you have, then take it to small group and... Um, bring it up there, and I trust that that'll be uh, a good time discussing it when you get to your small group. Let's um, just open in a word of prayer, and then we'll dive in. God, this morning again, we come before you. We say thank you for this opportunity to be here. Thank you for this opportunity to learn from you. And so, God, with that in mind, we would ask that you would come and that you would speak to us, that you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would reveal to us areas of our life that need to change, that you would show us where we can become closer to who you want us to be, closer to who you are. We ask too that you would show us areas in our life that we can maximize and that we can get even better results from, more potential out of, more uh, success with. And so to that end, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would work in us, focus our thoughts and our attention, be with us, translate where necessary, to make this relevant to each of us. We ask these things now in your precious name for your son's sake. Amen. All right. James 5, starting with verse 1, reading to verse 6. Now listen, you rich people. Isn't that an awesome way to start? Now listen, you rich people. I'd love to be able to do that a few places in my world. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. James, I don't think, is going to be ever implicated or accused of understatement. He goes right after it here. And general consensus is that he is speaking to rich Jewish non-believers in these six verses. You remember when we started the book of James, it was addressed to the 12, 12 tribes scattered. So it's written to the Jews. But it's also written in this particular context to the rich ones. And James has some issues that he's going to bring up. Uh, at the time... 
the gospel was spreading faster among the lower classes, those more economically challenged, than it was in the classes that were privileged. And that's not really surprising, is it? In Matthew 19, verses 23 to 25, Jesus says this to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So it's not surprising that it was going faster in the low classes uh, because Christ said it was going to be difficult to go in the upper classes. He's told us that. But why is that? I think there's a couple of reasons. Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but two of them I'll highlight quickly this morning. The first is that when you are rich, when you're privileged, you usually or often will have less a sense of your need. You're more self-sufficient. You're more independent. You can accomplish the challenges that you face on your own. And so with not having as much that is beyond your ability, then you don't have to look as far elsewhere to find help with that. You can accomplish it yourself. So I think that that's one of the first reasons that wealth makes it difficult for us to grasp faith and, and trust in Christ. But secondly, with wealth, you have more of a potential to try and address any needs that you find in your life on your own again. You can use your wealth to pursue other options or other answers to those problems that you have. So you can f try and find answers in other areas by just spending money, materialism, whatever. You can try and supplant that need, supplant that hole that you have by filling it with something different. And when you're not in an economic position to do that, you have less ability, therefore you look for it from somewhere else. So the gospel was spreading quicker through the lower classes. But before we move on, I want to just stop and point out two more things about this particular section uh, before we look at it in depth. And the first thing is, is that note that Christ says that it is hard for the rich man to get to heaven. He doesn't say that it's impossible. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. And secondly, note that Christ was not speaking against wealth. There's lots of people in Scripture, heroes of the faith, that were wealthy. You can look at Abraham, Job, Joseph of Arimathea. All of them uh, and others were wealthy individuals who found great faith in God. So he's not talking about wealth, but James is talking about how the wealthy use their wealth. And he's going to dive into it right here in this chapter. We're going to be talking about the same subject, how we use our wealth over the next few weeks. And James unpacks it here in a very definitive way and from the negative sense. James points out four things. First of all, he points out that these people were hoarding their wealth. They have more than they can even begin to spend, and they're just keeping it stockpiled. Secondly, they are using their wealth to cheat others. They've been denying people their wages or withholding their wages, making them wait for their wages, those that have been working for them. Thirdly, they're indulging in their wealth. And finally, they are condemning and murdering innocent men because they have the ability to do so. All of these things are sins against God. We start off as we look at hoarding your wealth. That violates God's instructions to us that we are to care for the poor. We're to give to the poor. Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4 say this, Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. I think... This passage right here might have been the one that James is referring to. He had this one maybe in mind specifically as he was writing in, in, his, in, the, cha in the fifth chapter. But it may also be other ones. Exodus 22, verses 25 to 27, 
pick up on that same theme. Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10. Proverbs 14, 31. Proverbs 19, 17. For those of you that aren't inclined to regard the Old Testament, which is a, an oversight, um, but if you like the New Testament, check out Matthew 25, verses 42 and 45. Ephesians 4, verse 28. And even James 1, 27, where James says that true religion, what is acceptable to God, is when we look after widows and orphans. So they're hoarding their wealth. And they're not only hoarding it, it's a double jeopardy because they're stockpiling it and they're not even taking advantage of it themselves. They're not even using it to gain interest or what have you. They've just got it piled up. Uh, for those of you that are of my vintage, which leaves out some of you down here in the front row, um, you might remember uh, Scrooge McDuck. And um, if you were old enough to remember that and, and uh, you know, you were inclined to read good literature like comic books, you'll remember those stories about Scrooge McDuck lying in his vault, in his pajamas, playing with his cash, playing with his gold. This is kind of the picture that I get as I read this passage here. They've got so much wealth, I'm not even taking it to a bank, I'm just putting it in my vault and it's just going to sit there and every once in a while I'll look at it. And that's about all it does. So that's double jeopardy. They're not using it for others, they're not using it for themselves, they're just hoarding it. But he carries on. James says they're withholding wa wages, which is to say they're taking liberties. Because of who they are, because of their wealth, because of their power, they don't have to pay out. That guy needs this job. He doesn't have any choice. If I don't hire him, chances are he's going to go hungry. So I'll get to it when I get to it. I'll pay you later, maybe if I pay you at all. And that's a problem. In Deuteronomy 24, verses 14 and 15, it says, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. More verses to back that up. Leviticus 19, 13. Jeremiah 22, verse 13. Malachi 3, verse 5. And again, in, Ma in New Testament, Matthew 10, 10. Luke 10, 7. Colossians 4, 1. Check them out. We're not to take liberties, especially regarding the poor. And those that we've hired, those that are working for us, those that we have a, an option to because of our status. We can't take advantage of them. We have to do right by them. Verse 5 carries on. You have lived on earth in luxury and indulgence. James is speaking here to covetousness. Covetousness, which is defined as being inordinately or wrongly desirous of wealth or possessions. Think of that. Inordinately or wrongly desirous of wealth or possessions. That flies in the face of God's command that we are to be content with what we have, not preoccupied with gaining more and more wealth. Hebrews 13 verse 5 speaks to this. We're to be content wherever God has placed us in whatever circumstance, we're to be content with what he's given us. And when we become covetousness, or enter into covetousness, when we begin to covet, then we sin. It takes us out of where God wants us to be and puts us in opposition to who he is and what he wants us to do. It leads to a trust in riches rather than trust in God. We begin to rely on our wealth to shelter us or to solve the problems, problems that we face in life. So it, we rely on our checkbook to keep us from running into a problem rather than God. And it leads us to also forget God in general as we begin to start and follow our own wants and desires because of our ability. 
So as we do that, as we be become gods for ourselves, we leave the true God behind, and we just follow the desires of our hearts and whatever we want to do, and that's sin. And finally, it's idolatry. When we enter into this level of pursuit of pleasure and wealth and material gain, we set that up as an idol in our lives, and we become adulterers. Colossians 3, verse 5, and Ephesians 5, verse 3. It also may speak to, it doesn't necessarily have to, but it may speak to avarice, which is extreme greed. And it may also speak to wantonness. James might be addressing the fact that these people are living extravagant or unduly lavish lives. And it has shades of lawlessness to it, where we become unruly, unchaste, lewd, or licentious. And it's not hard to understand how that's contrary to who God is and what He wants from us. So that's three things already, and we see they're way off track. But the fourth thing is horrendous, because they're killing people that are innocent in their pursuit of their wealth. Now, I don't know, I don't think there's anybody here that's done that, but we've been there, right? We've seen that movie where somebody owns the little house on the block and the big developers coming in and they want that piece of property because they've got a new development in mind. And Joe is just happy in his house and he doesn't want to sell. And pretty soon it becomes a, a fight. And so Mr. Moneybags says to somebody, could you just eliminate the problem for me? Make it go away, because I got places to go and things to do, and it's in my way. He's in my way. And that's kind of the, the scenario here. Crazy to think that you can become so absorbed in wealth that you can actually justify taking somebody out. So James is incensed by all of this. And he compares the people that are doing this to livestock that are out in the field feeding. And they're feeding and they're feeding and they're feeding without any other care in the world than just feeding themselves. And he says, you don't understand, but today you're going to be slaughtered. This is where this is leading to. It's coming. You're going to be slaughtered just like a cow. which is to say that God is coming and he is going to deal with this because you're out of line. You're off base. You're sinning against him. And that doesn't last forever. Now, at this point, if you're like me, I'm excited that this is written to the rich Jewish non-believers because it doesn't get a whole lot further away from me than that. I'm not Jewish. I'm not rich. And I'm a believer. So that's awesome. And I'll grant you that you're probably the same this morning. You're not likely Jewish here this morning. And you probably haven't um, killed anyone. So you're not the same in that regard. And hopefully you're believers. If you're not, we want to talk to you about that. But what scares me is despite the fact that we have that much different from these people, I'm freaked out by how much we have in common. Think about it. How often do you give to the poor? How often do you see a need, somebody that has a need, and you reach into your wallet and you take out some cash and say, hey, listen, let me take care of that for you. I can see you need some help. How often do you step in, into the mix when somebody is being taken advantage of because they can't fight back? And you step in and say, hey, wait a second. 
this isn't right. What you're doing to this person here isn't right. And you settle that or you find a way to account for it for that, that person that's being taken advantage of. How often do you take liberties? And you don't have to be that rich to take liberties. As I look at my life, I do that. As rich as I am or as non-rich as I am, I see that I take liberties by virtue of my position. I encounter people that aren't as well off as I am. I encounter people that have to be subject to me in some way, shape, or form because of my position. And I'll take advantage of that. Do you? And how often do we use our wealth to indulge ourselves? When you get your paycheck, have you already planned how you're going to use it to spend on yourself so that you're more comfortable, so that you're having more fun, so that life is better as you see it for yourself? It was written to a different group, but it applies to us today. Let's carry on. James 7 to 12, 5, 7 to 12 is an encouragement to those that are probably under the persecution of these guys that are experiencing some of this stuff themselves. And I'm going to let you unpack that in your small groups. We're going to jump to James 5, 13 to 17, which is about prayer. Is that going to work? There we go. James 5, 13 to 17. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. So we go to verse 13. If anyone of you is in trouble, he should pray. If any, is anyone happy, he should sing songs of praise. Songs of praise... If you're like me, you look at that and you say, well, what does that, how does that fit in here? We're talking about prayer, then we're talking about songs of praise, then we're talking about prayer again. Somebody said that praise to God is the highest form of prayer. So if you consider it in those terms, then this makes perfect sense. And James is saying, whatever your circumstances, be they good or bad, if you're going through good things or if you're going through bad things, then pray. That should be your first line of action. Your first course is to pray. But how often is it that we do the exact opposite? Things are going badly. We're in trouble. And what do we do? Well, we look inwards. We look at ourselves and go, what am I going to do to fix this? How can I solve this problem? And we start to race in our minds and go around and around trying to figure out what I need to do to overcome whatever it is that's in front of me that I'm facing. And so we look inside. And often it's the, same as we, uh, it's the same as when we find something really good in our lives. We look back in and go, well, yeah, I deserve this. I've been working hard. So I'm going to enjoy this. Or, you know, I'm a good guy. It's right that this would be happening to me. And we take credit for it. We look at ourselves and we find ways that we can justify why this is happening when we should be going to God and saying, God, I've got this problem. Would you, would you help me with this? Would you show me what I can learn in this? Would you show me what you're doing through this so that I can join you in it and participate with it? God, things are going so well. Thank you that it comes from you. I recognize that I didn't do anything of my own doing. 
to merit this. And again, help me to understand what it is you're up to, what you can teach me in this. Help me to leverage it so that I can do with it what you want me to do with it. You know, when we don't talk, that's usually the sign of a bad relationship, isn't it? When we know of a problem between two people and we're trying to explain it to someone, we'll say, you know, they're not talking. Not talking right now. And that says a whole bunch, doesn't it? Or conversely, you know, we can say that we've got good relationships with people and I've got great relationships with lots of people that I don't talk to regularly. But if you talk to me and you find out who I do talk to a lot, more than not, that will lead you to the people that I have the best relationships with because they're the people that I care to talk to and that I make a point of talking to. I find ways to talk to them. I find ways to get together with them. So it's the same thing here. God, uh, James is, is inspiring us. He's, he's directing us to, to c communicate with God, whatever our circumstances are, because in that, in that communication, whether we're in hard times or in good times, we will find that as the best avenue to pursue our relationship with Him. He can work through that with us. And we have even less opportunity then of going off the rails on either side of that same coin. Going off because things are tough and I get mad at God or going off because things are good and I can forget Him. When I talk to Him, I stay in relationship with Him. And so James directs us to, to that. He carries on. Is there any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Okay, and again, even within this subject this morning, we're not going to unpack all of this. We can't get to it all. So I, I look forward to hearing how you do it in your small groups. You'll have a little bit more time there. And I hope you can dive into this a little bit more. But I'm going to just offer some thoughts, some notes on this, pass, this section of the passage here quickly that we can just uh, apply really quickly for ourselves. First of all, look at who calls who. If you're sick, you should call the elders. Okay, and I'm just bringing this up because it's really pragmatic. I find this oftentimes here at the church. Well, have you been to see so-and-so? They're sick. Well, no. I didn't know. Oh, have you been to the hospital to visit somebody? No. Are they in the hospital? Well, yeah, they've been there for a week. Didn't know. So pragmatically, it helps when you call us to let us know that you would like us to come and pray with you. I've never seen the elders once say, sorry, busy, can't make it. Okay, but it needs to start with you, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. Another point, there's no magic in the oil. The oil, there's different significance to the oil, and I'm not going to unpack all of that. That's a message even in and of itself. Um, but there's cultural things, there's spiritual um, points to both, both sides of the oil. But suffice to say for this morning that the oil is not the, the magic in this equation. You don't need oil to pray for somebody and have them healed. This passage also does not guarantee healing. Oftentimes, they'll find that people will come to this passage and they'll say, well, we did that. And look, nothing happened. The fact is, is that God's will still applies here. And that we pray in His will, according to His will. And if it is His will, when we pray for healing, then He will heal. But if it's not, then we submit to His will. Okay, so don't make this a make it or break it thing in your faith where you just put God over a barrel and say, here we go, I'm doing this, you got to produce results because that's not the way that God works. And that's a whole discussion there too. When it says in the passage, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, notice that it is the prayer that makes the sick person well. It's not who offers the prayer. So James is pointing out that the trick and the magic isn't in the elders either. They have a bearing on it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the people themselves are not what 
make the, the prayer effective or not. It's the prayer that does it, and God is in the prayer. He's the one that will make the difference in these circumstances, not the elders. And that point is backed up in the next verse where it says, the prayers of a righteous person availeth much, or the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. So it's not that person that's effective and powerful. It's their prayers. That's when God takes them and does things because they've been given to him in prayer. So we can see then that it's not the people that make the prayer effective, but it can be the people that make the prayer non-effective. Okay? And so let's look at that just from this side really briefly and quickly. First of all, the prayer has to be offered in faith which is to say that when you're praying to God, you need to be of faith in God. James 1 at the beginning of the first book, first chapter, talks about praying for wisdom. But if you don't believe that God's going to answer that prayer, then you're not going to get the answer to that prayer. So you need to pray believing that God is able to provide that. And when you have faith that God can do it, then He's able and, and sometimes then he's willing to also engage with you there. But if you don't have that, that's a non-starter right off the hop. That prayer is not going to be effective. Secondly, those praying also need to be righteous, which is not to say that you have to be perfect. Okay, if we had to be perfect, we'd, we're done like dinner right off the hop because we, we miss it on that cut. To be righteous means that you have to be in good standing with God. You have to have things in place with Him. No sin harbored in your life, in your heart. You have to have confessed that. James goes on to talk about confession. We're not going to talk about that here either. There's great wisdom in confession, and there's ways to go about that. There's ways not to do it. And again, hopefully you can unpack some of that in your small group. But we need to be righteous, so we, so we can't be harboring a problem or a sin in our lives that we're consciously aware of and that we are ignoring, not willing to deal with it with God. We also need to be right with others around us. If we have sinned against somebody, then we need to go to them and apologize, ask their forgiveness, and seek uh, forgiveness there and get that right with them. Otherwise, again, God says, nope, until that's cleared up, buddy, we can't talk. We're not, we're not going there. You need to get that figured out first. So people don't guarantee success, but we can guarantee our ineffectiveness in prayer if we don't get those things right. James goes on and he uses the example of Elijah. as a great example because if you remember Elijah, if you go back and you study his story, you find out that he was just like us. He made some amazing things uh, had, he had some amazing things happen to him in his life, and God worked through him in amazing ways, including having him pray and having it not rain for three and a half years, not a drop. And then he prayed again, and the rains came. But when you see and you look at his life, you also find out that he failed just like we do. He had issues, but he would get those issues addressed with God. He addressed them and confessed them, and he got God to help him and work through him still, and his prayers availed much. They were powerful and effective. And that's what we strive for. That's what we're looking for, is to be like Elijah in our prayer life so that our prayers are effective and powerful. I want to shift gears here, and I'll come back to prayer. You know, as a church, we take this whole faith thing seriously. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. I hope that you understand that, you see that. Something that we do 24-7, we try and apply it to our lives day in and day out because we believe that there is a God, one true God. And we believe that His goal is to have a relationship with each one of us, that He wants to know us personally, and He wants us to know Him. But we also believe that because of sin and the fact that we all are sinners, that relationship has been broken. 
Sin creates a barrier between us and God. And we believe that the only way to get past that barrier is through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. He came, he died in our place, took the penalty for sin so that we could then resume a relationship with God, that we could begin a relationship God, with God when we place our trust in what Christ has done on our behalf. We believe that God has a specific plan for our lives, that he made us specifically and that he has set aside specific things for us to do, things that were designed for us to do before the creation of the world. And that when we find him and then we can find those things that we enter into the life that he had planned for us, a life that is abundant and full and rewarding and fulfilling, like we won't find it anywhere else. But we also believe that Satan is an actual being. And that Satan is bent on doing the exact opposite. His purpose is to do the exact opposite. He's here to make sure that we don't find God. That we never find faith in Christ. That we never understand what Jesus did on our behalf and accept his gift of salvation so that we can have a relationship with God. And failing in that, then Satan's goal becomes to derail us in our faith, to keep us from finding who God is and who he wants us to be and what he can do in our lives when we turn that over to him. And he wants us to be derailed from helping anyone else to find that faith in God too. So the question becomes at this point, have you made that decision? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with God? And if you don't, then we'd love to talk to you because that's so important. It's the number one decision that you'll ever make. But this morning, if you have come to that place where you have a faith in God, then the question is, well, then how do I grow in that relationship with him? How do I get to know him better? How do I find the life that he has planned for me? And there's a number of different ways that we do that. The first way that we do that is through reading his word. We believe that the Bible is his word. Regularly, Ryan is up here and he talks to you and he implores you, he begs you, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And as a staff, we stand right behind him in that because we believe that is the most fundamental thing that you can do. That is God's word. It's a blueprint for your life. It's how he speaks into our world and shows us who he wants us to be, shows us how he wants us to act. And as a staff, I've talked to the staff, we want you, we'd like to give you permission. In fact, it's even beyond permission. We would like to encourage you to come to us at any time. Any of us as staff, Come to us at any time and say, hey, what did you do today in your devotional time? What did you study today? What did you read? Where are you reading? Because it's that important. We need to be held accountable. And we hope that in being accountable on that and giving you that option, that that will also inspire you to do the same thing. Read. Get into your Bible and learn. We learn other ways as well. We learn in groups. We can speak into each other's lives and share with each other and, and help each other grow. That's why we encourage you to be at a church. We like it when you make it a priority be, to be here because we can speak into each other's worlds when we're here. We grow in our relationship. And that's why we hold so much weight uh, and importance on small groups. Get involved in a small group. Get to know these people. Let them into your lives so that they can speak into your world and that you can speak into theirs. And we, together then we can grow in our relationship with God, become the people that he wants us to be. We believe that you grow when you serve. And again, we encourage you to get involved here at the church. Find an area of service. When you serve others, when you help them grow, then you grow yourself. We want you to grow. Get involved and serve. We believe that you grow when you share your faith, when you get out there, and when you 
help someone else see where they're at with or without God. So share your faith. But we also believe that you grow when you pray. When you pray and when you have that com communion with God, when you have that com communication with God, then God can speak to you in your life. He can show you things in your life and you can grow. And since chapter 5 has this passage in it, we thought it was opportune this morning not to just talk about it, but we want to help you to grow in this area. There's something that we can do tangibly to help you grow in this area. And so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and they're going to hand out a prayer guide. It's a 30-day prayer guide. And what it does, it will help you to focus and expand and grow in your prayer life by becoming even more specific and strategic about your prayers. Now, if you're a guy here this morning and you just threw up a little bit in your mouth because you thought I was talking about scrapbooking, okay, bear with me, okay? I get it. Man, I've been there writing stuff down. The next thing Doug's going to want is I'm going to have to talk about my feelings. And the sissification of the church goes on. And I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about trying to find a specific and strategic way to make your prayers effective and powerful. And guys, that's got to turn any guy on. It's like more horsepower. We want more horsepower in our prayer life, in our spiritual lives. You wonder why God isn't real to you? How much have you engaged with him? Chapter 4 talks about that. Draw near to him, and he will not draw near to you. This is a way that we can draw near to God. So each day, we start off with praise and thanksgiving, and that's an attribute of God. God says, come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving. So whatever our circumstances are, good or bad, we can start with praying about who God is, and we can be thankful and praise him for that. So we start with that. There's instructions in your book. It will, you don't have to jot all these down. It'll, it'll tell you how to go about this. But then we go to confession, where we can list the things that we are failing in, the areas that we are struggling in, and we can ask God to help us specifically in those areas. God, pride's an issue for me today. I need to deal with my pride. I was lying. I didn't tame my tongue. I haven't been using my gifts to their advantage, the best advantage, the way you want me to. All those things, we can list them here, and we can deal with them with God. Intercession, that's where we pray for others, where we confess one to another and then pray for each other so that we can be healed. So for those that have shared issues with you, you can pray for them. You can pray for missionaries. You can pray for those that are being persecuted around the world for their faith. Lots of different options there. Then petitions, the things that we need personally, the things that we have that we would like God to address for us in our world. And lastly, answers or direction. And you can list when you get an answer from God. And that doesn't come every day necessarily. You might pray for days or weeks or months or years even. I've been praying for some things for years and I haven't yet had the answer that I'm hoping for. I haven't had an answer to the contrary. So I continue to pray for those things. And I trust one day that God will answer and I'll be able to, to write it down. But as he does provide for us direction and answers to prayer, write it down. Note them. And then as you look back, you'll be able to see God working in your life. And it's amazing how when you see tangible answers from him in your life that you begin to understand his direction for your life. And you can see that he is real. And you engage with him more because he's bolstered your faith through that, even in the no answers. So take advantage of that. And we want to do this for 30 days, and we trust that after 30 days that we'll all be better at praying and that this doesn't stop at the end of 30 days, but this just sort of fires us up and gets us into this habit so that we can then exercise this and leverage it for the rest of our lives. At the back of the book, you'll see, tell us about it. We love to hear how you're doing in this. It's one of our biggest challenges 
uh, as staff is how, how are people doing with what we're bringing every week? Are we growing? Is this effective? So we'd love to hear from you, especially if it's going well, but even if it's not, let us know. And that helps us to adjust. But it also can encourage others. When things are going for well, well for you and you see this working, then encourage others. And we can share those stories then as we go forward. So we're looking forward to what happens, how God will work and how he will change us and how he will grow us as a church as we engage with him in this process. And so let's start right now. Let's pray and ask that he would take us and that he would use us, that he would use this to make us better for him as we go forward. Pray with me. God, again this morning we say thank you for being so interested in our lives, for wanting to be a part of our lives with us. God, for the plan that you have for us, we would ask that you would take even this prayer guide, this journal. God, help us to do it. Help us to even just engage with you in this process. Overcome the obstacles that we put there, especially us guys. Help us to see where we can ratchet it up. We can be more effective for you. And God, thank you for James. Thank you for this book that he's given us. I pray, God, that as we go into our small groups this week, that everyone would be able to have even that much better a conversation there, that it can be a little bit more ex- uh, extrapolated and extracted as we have more time there. Help us again to learn. Help us even to go back individually over the days and weeks ahead in our personal devotions as we spend time reading your word. Help us to come back to this and to just run through it again and and remind ourselves of the things that we've talked about and and to see too the things that we haven't been able to to talk about. So thank you for that. We pray that you would work in our lives, that you would Help us to be the people that you want us to be and discover the life that you want for us so that we can share it also with others that don't know you yet. So to that end, God, I I pray all these things in your son's name for his sake. Amen.